Basic Brewing Radio is sponsored in part by the American Homebrewers Association. On Saturday, May 7, 2022, the American Homebrewers Association invites you to celebrate Big Brew for National Homebrew Day. Big Brew is an opportunity to fire up the kettle and raise a glass to the greatest hobby there is, homebrewing. Get a promo code for $5 off the annual American Homebrewers Association membership when you make the Big Brew Pledge. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing for offer details. The official 2022 Big Brew recipes, homebrewing tutorials, and more. That's at homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to get $5 off when you make the Big Brew Pledge. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 14th, 2022. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Mike Tonsmeyer, the mad fermentationist and co-founder of Sapwood Cellars, talks to us about hops in our latest episode on the topic of recipe development. Mike's been with us for 16 years or so, and a lot has changed in the world of hopping since we first started talking. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Financial supporters this past week got to see an early release of the Toasted Rye Doppelbach video episode, along with the behind-the-scenes video and the recipe for the beer. I'll release that video to the general public at the uh, end of this week. Next week, financial supporters will get an early release of the video that we did about my Christmas Day Kettle Sour Brett beer <laughs> that you heard <laughs> went through several weeks of trials and tribulations before finally going into the bottle and and, and winding up to be a, a nice and fun and tart and tasty uh, brew. I think I've settled on the uh, next beers to brew, and I think I'm going to go small, a small batch, that is. On the Citrus Tincture Sampler show, which is harder to say than I imagined, uh, Steve mentioned the concept of doing a, a beer inspired by my lemon custard pie using biscuit malt, lactose, and citrus tincture in the beer. Well, that sounds darn tasty, but I... But, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to dedicate to myself to a five-gallon batch. Uh, I don't want to commit myself to a five-gallon batch of that kind of beer, at least initially. So I think that's a good candidate for a six-pack batch. And in addition to the lemon tincture, I think I could maybe do a, a strawberry and jalapeno custard pie beer, and maybe something else that we haven't tried yet to dose at the end there before bottling. Uh, and then I've been thinking about the next uh, tincture episode and, and what we want to do there. And I think I want to go dark, at least with the beer. Maybe do a dark beer and, and pair it with tinctures of, of coconut or mint or coffee. I don't know. We'll see. Let's talk for a minute about our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast. Imperial Yeast has become a trusted companion, not only for supporting this show, but for brewing excellent beers as well. Gone are the days where I pitched liquid yeast and worried about extended lag times or had to plan ahead a day or two to make a starter to ensure a timely start of a fermentation. You know what I'm talking about. With Imperial Organic Yeast, my stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make uh, starters anymore for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. With those 200 billion cells in each easy-to-open pack, my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime. And Imperial has smart folks working in quality assurance and technical support to answer your questions if you do have an issue. Uh, as you've heard on this show, uh, ask your local homebrew shop about Imperial Organic Yeast and check them out, as always, at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. Okay, let's talk to Mike Tonsmeyer on recipe development and hops. Mike Tonsmeyer, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. It's a pleasure as always, James. It's been too long, as always. <laughs> it has. I've been busy. I, I, I don't have quite as much time to uh, 
write about beer or talk about beer as I used to when I was uh, singing a cubicle at the uh, federal government now that I uh, <laughs> have to make beer and clean stuff all day, every day, almost. <laughs> I think I've talked to m- more to your partner in crime, Scott Janish, lately than I've talked to you. Uh, how, are, how are things at uh, Sapwood Cellars? Uh, they're going really well. Scott's uh, at the brewery right now, finishing out uh, the brew on IPA. I got a day at home to work on our uh, quarterly federal excise and state excise taxes, my you know, favorite part of being a, a brewery owner. So just a little taste of the cubicle life. You know, I, I still have a, a, a interest in spreadsheets. We recently got a sales pitch from a company that said, you know, you can throw out all your spreadsheets and we'll do all the whatever for you. I wrote back, yeah, I, I'm an economist. I, I don't mind the spreadsheets. <laughs> Barking up the wrong virtual tree there. <laughs> Particularly for a few thousand dollars a year or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. I get every now and then I get uh, spam from people who want to edit video for me and edit audio. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks, though. You need, you need a break sometime. <laughs> well, I'm here to I'm, we're here to talk about recipe. This is another in the series of our recipe development episodes. And uh, we're going to talk about hops. And I, I do not. My goal is not to solve how to use hops in recipe development in this one show. I just wanted to, to, to let the pressure off of you if there was any pressure that you were feeling. <laughs> It's a it's a wide topic and very deep, um, but what I want to do is is kind of get your take on how trends are going. You know wh- how new recipe or new brewers who are developing their own recipes for the first time some things that will kind of you know give them a standing and 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 how to even start to look at the question of hops in beers. Um, Way back in, I think it was September of 2006, you sent us a six-pack of yeah. beers with single hops in them. And I believe uh, Steve and Andy and I tasted them along with you on the show. And I tell you, that was a defining moment in <laughs> in my brewing uh, because those simple little small batch beers that you made – really showed off the hops and they were some of the I mean some of the best pale ales that I think we had ever had. I mean, you know, this is at that time, you know, craft beer in Northwest Arkansas was pretty primitive. <laughs> and and so uh, those beers um really changed our our viewpoint on 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 hoppy beers. And so whenever I think of hops, you know, you're one of the people who uh, who hop into my mind because of that. Do you remember that experiment? Yeah, that, that was my first time uh, being being on the, the podcast. And, and I think I just sent them to you as a thank you because you'd been doing some small batch stuff and I just sort of wanted to share it. It was before I started the blog, before I um, you know, e- even dreamed about uh, writing a book or opening a brewery. Um, and yeah, and that, that I did a lot of that sort of early on. I did some experiments with Belgian candy sugar. I did some experiments with, you know, different malts and things like that. Um, and honestly, I think still to this day, you know, brewing a single hop beer is one of the best ways, particularly if you, um, taste along the way to really learn about a particular variety. Yeah, it's an excellent strategy, uh, paring down the ingredients and doing very simple beers, with simple recipes, you know, we've talked about it several times on the show. Uh, when you started brewing, were you intimidated by the recipe development process yourself? Oh, a hundred percent. Honestly, for me early on, the, the only reason I was really ever started uh, making my own recipes was um, designing great beers by uh, Ray Daniels. Mm-hmm. Uh, just that you could drill down on a particular recipe and he'd give you, you know, um, here are the ranges for a, di- a different malt or here are common hop additions um, that you sort of felt like, even if I'm not perfect, I'm at least in the ballpark of what is going to make something that's at least vaguely in this style. Um, and sort of the, the earliest recipes I ever did were much more sort of like combinations of things. I would find a recipe, you know, a couple recipes online and say, oh, you know, 
I see they all have, you know, pale malt. I see they all have some crystal malt in them. I remember going into a homebrew shop early on and asking for a crystal malt and caramel malt. And I, in my head that there was some real difference between those two things. And the, the nice gentleman at the homebrew shop explained that they're pretty much the same thing, that, you know. <laughs> I didn't probably need crystal 40 and caramel 40 <laughs> in the same recipe. Um, but it, like anything, I mean, I, I think um, brewing is more daunting than say making dinner because you're, you're making a batch of beer that takes a, a few hours. It's going to be um, not only that, but it's going to be something you're going to have to drink over the course of a while, you know, rather than just making a, a grilled cheese sandwich. If you put too many onions in it, well, it's not a great grilled cheese sandwich. And then, you know, for dinner, you can put less onions in there. Um, you're going to be drinking that brown ale for a while and really driving into your head that that was too much chocolate malt and it's a little too astringent or, or you really don't like Fuggles hops. They taste a little like dirt and probably you don't want to add them to any more beers. Yeah. And there's, there's such a, you know, it's, it's a few weeks between your your efforts of tweaking a recipe if you <laughs> you know you brew the recipe and then four weeks later you get to really start to taste what the beer is really like the uh in the beginning or when when i first started brewing there were certain times that you put in the hops you put in the hops at 60 minutes yeah uh, for, for bitterness you maybe you do one at 30 minutes for for flavor and then like five minutes before the end of the boil you would put in for aroma. Yeah. And then uh, if you were really adventurous, you would dry hop. And maybe a half an ounce, maybe one ounce if you were feeling zesty. Yeah. <laughs> and back then, uh, the state of the hops were such that, you know, it, sometimes it was difficult to get really fresh, really good hops. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, when... oh, I, I I remember going to homebrew stores and them having them in in ball jars, and you would you know measure out how much you wanted, and you know just screw screw that top back on for the next person. Were they even refrigerated? I, I remember them being refrigerated at, at, back in my day in the early two thousands. <laughs> yeah, I think Charlie Papazian uh, said that uh, it was a while before he figured out that that hops were supposed to be green. <laughs> because the hops that he got were all brown when we, he first we, started. <laughs> we we still get some Australian hops that are a little, a little um, uh, brownish gray uh, sometimes. That's never a good sign. No. <laughs> Time for a lambic. <laughs> Not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so you you mentioned designing great beers. And uh, in there is featured, you know, Ray Daniels wrote the book. In, in there is featured Ray Daniels. Uh, IBU formula, the formula mm -hmm. for uh, for figuring out um, uh, international bitterness units or, or the, how bitter your beer is going to be. And boy, I've still got legal note, legal pads where I went through that formula, you know, when I was designing a pale ale or, you know, a yeah. stout or, you know, just a basic beer and just really was stressing out about um, getting those IBUs balanced with the, the gravity and, you know, all this stuff and, and was really um, anxious about uh, not screwing the beer up in that way. Are the IB in, in today's modern world of, of brewing, are the IBU formulas as useful as they used to be? Well, I, I could answer that a couple of ways. I, I my first IPA I ever brewed was inspired by uh, Russian River V has always been super open with their recipes. And uh, there's a recipe for Pliny the Elder. And I took it and I, it, ProMash told me I had, I think it was 269 IBU. <laughs> and when, when you're doing that number of IBUs, the formula is essentially irrelevant because you are so far above the saturation point um, for uh, Samurai's alpha acids that there's really no difference between 100, 200, 300 IBUs. Um, back when I started brewing, there was the sort of an IBUs war where people would brag that their beer had 200, 300, 400. Um, I think McKellar did a uh, 1,000 IBU beer. Um, <laughs> at that point, you have essentially just broken the formula. The, the formula is not smart enough to know that the, the alpha acids sort of cap out at a certain point. Um, when Russian River had uh, Plain the Elder um, actually tested for alpha acids, 
it was in the mid to high 60s. Mm. Um, and so much of that is even if the wort is at 100 or, or 90 IBUs, um, during fermentation, the pH drops, that causes some alpha acids to drop out of solution. Uh, dry hopping changes the, uh, the alpha acids in the beer by taking out iso alpha acids, adding um, plain unisomerized alpha acids, which are less bitter. And so, I mean, sort of the answer is that um, the formulas give you a good snapshot of probably how much bitterness is in the wort itself. Mm. But if it doesn't take into account uh, dry hopping, fermentation, a lot of those things, it's not going to give you a complete picture of how bitter that beer is going to taste um, in the glass when you're done and ready to drink it. I think that in the kind of now we would think of them as old style beers, you know, Pilsners and and uh, and Porters and Stouts and and, you know, standard American pale ales uh I think in in those styles of beers, the IBU formulas that you that you find are probably a lot more useful than say you know the big hoppy beers that you and Scott are brewing at at Sapwood, right? A hundred percent. That that really is what those formulas. I mean, honestly, those formulas were designed for macro loggers in the 1960s, mm. um, and so yeah, they were designed for people who were aiming for. You know, 12, 15, 20 IBUs, that sort of thing. And exactly, if, you, if you're doing so many of those classic European styles, so many, um, you know, brew pub beers, American, you know, the brown ales, the porters, um, where you're focusing on those earlier um, uh, boil additions, um, where the formulas really start to break down are things like, you know, heavy whirlpool additions. I, I know um, the early formulas I was using, if you add uh, hops at flame out, it just counted them as zero. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really changed now that um, I, I, th I think it was sort of a Ray Daniels, again, sort of popularized or uh, Daniels or Mosher, the, the hop stand sort of concept about 10 years ago. Um, sort of mimicking uh, what we do on commercial scale where we're whirlpooling for 20 minutes and the hops are in there just about out of boil, you know, 210, 211 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, 99 degrees centigrade. Um, and then settling for 20 minutes in our case, and then we're running through a, a plate uh, chiller. And so probably another 30 minutes in most cases where the hops are still sitting in that, you know, near boiling wort. Um, you know, you're really getting a significant amount of bitterness um, in that case. And I would certainly want to use, if you were doing those things, a formula that took that into account. Yeah. And that's the, that's one challenge uh, or opportunity, if you want to use another corporate word, that uh, homebrewers have when they look at recipes based on, you know, commercial beers, in that when you guys add hops at the Whirlpool, it's going to stay hotter a lot longer than if I, in my five-gallon batch, <laughs> add, yeah. add hops. Uh, you know, especially if I start running the chiller, you know, that's going to knock down uh, pretty low pretty quickly. Um, exactly. So, so in your in your big hoppy beers, let's talk about those for a moment. In, sure. in your big hoppy beers, do you even add hops at the beginning of the boil anymore? Um, so even even the last three years that we've been uh, making IPAs and double IPAs at Sapwood, we've really sort of changed our approach to things. Um, and a big part of that is that uh, about a year and a half ago, we add, uh, so we have a 10 barrel system, so about 300 gallon batches. And we add a bunch of 20 barrel tanks. So two batches take you know, two, two full work production cycles to fill. Um, and so the, the trick there is uh, at bigger breweries, so essentially rather than generally getting like a giant system, um, you know, so the biggest craft breweries in the country only have, say, a 50-barrel system. But what they'll do is they'll brew eight batches to fill uh, a giant tank where uh, we can't because essentially we have to do a full boil. We have to run out all the work before we can run off the second batch. Um, as you get to a bigger brewery, you have a dedicated whirlpool. You can cool the work going into the whirlpool. You can then start running off your next batch from the mash tun to the kettle. Um, but just for sort of time considerations, and, and that's where so many of the great house characters of things come out of, is just, you know, you have to do this for, you know, engineering reasons. 
Um, and so what we do for a lot of our beers is the first batch of the day, uh, we do a Whirlpool at uh, essentially just off the boil at, you know, it starts at about 211. Maybe it's down to 205 or 206 by the time we're done running off. Um, and we just add, you know, half the hops to that uh, initial Whirlpool. And then the second Whirlpool, generally Scott's shift, uh, will run it through the heat exchanger back into the kettle to knock the temp down. Hmm. Um, and that allows us to get um, sort of two different hop additions. One where we're getting a lot more bitterness out of it. Um, early on, we were adding some hops early in the boil. Um, just for that first one, um, once you start going through the plate chiller, you don't want to have high hops in the wort. Mm -hmm. um, the hops can get sort of jammed up in the, uh, the chiller. Um, and then we sort of use which hops we add to which whirlpool and the temperature of the second whirlpool as sort of our levers for how much bitterness we want in the beer. Huh. Um, so for a pale ale, we always try to have some pretty low alpha acid hops, some crystal, some cascade, um, something that has a, you know, a nice, fun, fruity, citrusy, whatever aroma, but we'd love it if it was three or four or 5% alpha acid, just because that first whirlpool is at 210 degrees. It's going to be sitting there for an hour. We're going to get a lot of isomerization. And then we can, we can do Columbus or Chinook or Centennial or Idaho seven or Simcoe or Mosaic, these higher alpha hops that have a lot of real great aromatic, fun, you know, maybe yeast interaction, maybe um, survivable compounds, whatever it is. And they can go in that second whirlpool at 155 or 160 degrees where we're getting very little isomerization, where we're getting very little of the bitterness out of them. Um, and that sort of gives us that sort of, again, another lever to pull. Hmm. Um, for, for a double IPA, something that, that we're finishing with some decent sweetness to it, it's a lot less important. Uh, but it's it, things like those pale ales where we're really conscious of not having too much bitterness. Smoke on the Mountain, the tea-based mead by our friends and sponsors at Gronfell and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont is now available. And certified mediacs are loving it. Molly T says Smoke on the Mountain is smoky tea with a bit of heat from Merkin chili pepper and slight hibiscus flavor on the back end. And, and who doesn't like hibiscus flavor on the back end. Patrick C. got three cases of smoke on the mountain and prefers to drink it at room temperature because of the spices that it brings forward. However, Patrick uh, says that cooled, he gets more tea and lemon flavor. Steve M. says the smoke is accentuated cold, but when the mead's warmed up a bit, the heat of the pepper comes right through. Sounds delicious. You can find smoke on the mountain at Groenfell and have some sent to you. It's a 5.2% craft mead with Ceylon black tea and lemon, maple-infused merkin chili, and hibiscus. Wow. Check out a video on the Gronfell YouTube channel of brewers John and Jake cracking open a can of smoke on the mountain and get your own, along with lots of other honey-based deliciousness, at family-owned and operated Gronfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. So the the traditional sixty minute hop addition, where you're where you're adding hops at the beginning of a sixty minute boil, mm -hmm. that's for a beer like that, it's a thing of the past. Uh, for us, it is, and and honestly, I think our beers are more bitter than most of the sort of uh, juicy, hazy New England IPAs that I taste from other breweries. Um, a lot of our our beers, according to the IBU formula we're using, are still. 60, 70, 80 IBUs. Um, and a, a lot of the New England IPAs I taste from other breweries uh, taste considerably lower than that. I, I like to finish our beers a little bit sweeter than maybe the sort of average person. But then I also like a little bit more bitterness to help sort of uh, balance out that sweetness. Huh. So, so if you're a, a novice home brewer and you, you haven't designed your own recipes, I mean, I guess number one, the a biggest a big piece of advice is like you said earlier kind of look at the recipes that are already out there and kind of use those as a springboard yeah. um but when you're thinking about say you know saying uh, you know like a, a standard uh more like a traditional you know maybe you know british pale ale something like mm -hmm. that you probably would would keep the 60 minute edition in there right or and and then would you 
uh, are like hops at 30 minutes? Are they are they a waste or what's, what's your opinion? I think it was the, the brewer from uh, Almanac Brewing at one point told me, I make saisons, but, you know, they're pretty much they're pretty much like IPAs that like the tastes have gone so far towards hops that if you don't goose up the hops a little bit, um, people are going to be let down. And mm. so I'll say that the hot, the traditional beers we make at Sapwood Cellars often have a Whirlpool edition, often have um, some, some more late boil editions compared to what the classic uh, rules of thumb might be. So we, we do a um, English pale ale or a special bitter or something along those lines called hedge trimmer. And um, it's sort of our, our lawnmower beer for England. Um, and that gets some Styrian Goldings and some East Kent Goldings in the Whirlpool. Um, and just like helping to push those herbal, orange, you know, spicy, earthy kinds of things. We, we do the same thing with a lot of our German beers. Our, our uh, German Fest beer has uh, Tetnang in the Whirlpool. Our Pilsner has, uh, this one had Pearl that we just did. Um, I think a lot of those beers for the modern palate are not as hoppy as a craft beer drinker is maybe going to expect. And mm. so if, if you're really going for really that like old school classic import sort of thing, definitely, you know, sort of stick to the 60 minute edition and maybe, maybe a small edition at, you know, 20 minutes or something like that, just to add a little bit of um, aroma, but like, don't shy away from um, having a, a pretty healthy dose. We, we don't go, crazy with it, but it might be close to say, you know, one to two ounces for a five gallon batch, some, something like that for, um, you know, an, an English or a German beer that we want to be um, leaning towards the hop. So we, we wouldn't do it for something like uh, uh, an English brown ale or a, a Czech dark lager, maybe something like that. But, you know, if, if you want it to be a little bit hop leaning, um, I wouldn't shy away from some hops in the Whirlpool. Hmm. One thing that we've discovered on on the show during these experiment uh, beers, especially if using extracts, there are beers, you know, like for the sampler series, where I don't even boil the extract at all. Uh, I put the extract in, in the water as it's warming up. I bring it just to the boil. I add some hops, and I take take it off the, the, uh, the burner. This is for a mm-hmm. one-gallon batch. Sure. For, for a 10-minute hop stand chill it down, and pitch the yeast. So, you know, the rules have changed that much, uh, you know, in the 26 or whatever many years I've been brewing, in that, you know, especially for extract beers, you don't have to have a full boil. You don't have to put, you know, your all of your ingredients into a 60-minute boil. And so that uh, also factors into recipe development, too. You can even break those rules... Uh, when you are designing your own recipes nowadays, yeah, no, a hundred percent. We we do some sort of out of the box things, and that's that's so much of what brewing is to me is that you know it's taking good notes, it's um, tasting the beer um, during the process. You know, try taste that beer after fermentation before you dry hop it is is one of the best times to taste that beer and really get a sense for what that uh, fermentation character is like, what that whirlpool or what that the, the hot side hopping contributed and then dry hop and then taste it again. Um, that, you know, once, once you dry hop it, it's going to change it so much that, you know, trying it early on is just going to give you more data points on, um, you know, what, what the results of your various choices were. And, if you're tasting weird things or off flavors before dry hopping and you dry hop and it tastes okay, that still might be a sign that, you know, there's something iffy with the hot side process, but if it tastes great and you would drink it as is, as a pale ale before dry hopping and that tastes like an IPA after dry hopping it, that's a real great sign that you're doing something right on the hot side, that that beer is already tasting good. Mm. And the dry hops are like enhancing it rather than, covering up what, you know, maybe off flavors or something like that. So if you if you do decide as a, as a home brewer to add hops at the beginning of a 60-minute boil for a more traditional uh, beer, 
Do you yourself look at the variety or do you more look at just the potential IBUs? In other words, you know, does it matter what hops you put in at the beginning of an extended boil? Uh, is any of that character going to be left over? Are there compounds that are going to be accentuated more in some varieties than others? Or, or is or, uh, alpha acids just alpha acids? Yeah, I so we, we do not do many beers that just have the 60-minute edition. And despite that, I have multiple anecdotes about how amazingly uh, intense early boil additions can be. Hmm. Um, the first uh, canned imperial stout we did was a beer called uh, Flaked. Um, my wife's last name is Flake. We did beer with flaked oats, flake coconut. And I just thought the easiest thing to do would be to buy a generic alpha acid heavy hop extract called Flex Hop. And the idea is it's just something you can pour in. It's flowable. It has a, you know, easily calculatable number of IBUs. You're not going to have a green material in there. So you're not going to be adding, you know, polyphenols or any harshness. Um, it, it tastes like an Andes mint. Mm. It was amazing how strong that minty flavor was from this hop extract. I, I, I could look back now, but it was at least a 60 minute edition, if not a 90 minute edition to the boil. In a in a beer that started at one one thirty, that was low, like just huge amounts of caramel malt and roast malt, and and all those sorts of things, and that minty thing. To this day, I, I we opened one of the last cans we had of it about a year and a half old at our staff Super Bowl party, and it tasted more like mint than ever. The coconut, the vanilla had faded. The this minty hop thing. I don't know what hop they used. If if the hop differs from batch to batch. Um, And then not long after that, we did our first barley wine. And um, I'd heard that uh, uh, Anchorage Brewing used uh, Galaxy hops in their barley wine. And I'd heard a few other cool breweries were using Galaxy hops to add this this fun fruity thing when you add them sort of early in the boil. Um, And we had a bag of Galaxy that was sort of okay. It was was a little um, older. It wasn't... um, something we would be excited to dry hop with. And so we threw some, some galaxy hops in there early in the boil. And again, it's, it's almost uh, 19 months later. And that beer still has this intensely almost discordant uh, tropical fruit sort of thing. Hmm. Um, so I would say, be, be careful with your bittering hop. You know, <laughs> if, if, a, if a hop doesn't, um, suit suit a beer um i wouldn't use it you know i wouldn't use um high alpha aromatic american hops in your uh british czech german you know traditional style unless you're looking for a unique uh distinct um differentiating sort of thing I, i would sort of you know those classic rules are there for a reason if you want to make a really great english beer get a yeast and malt and hops from the the British Isles. If you want to make a great German beer, you know, go for Weirman, go for Hallertau, um, that that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, don't in, unless you're trying to do something intentionally. Um, I, I wouldn't stray too far from that, particularly early on, and particularly if you're if you're designing your first recipe. The more you can stick to ingredients from a place, the more that beer will taste like it's from that place. Lately, I've been getting questions about electric brewing systems in the mailbag. Uh, For instance, listener Philip says he's renovating a 1942 Craftsman bungalow and plans to put an electric brewing system in as the last phase of the construction. And Philip wrote to ask my advice on what system to get. And listener Jeff wrote in because he's trying to decide between a three-vessel system and brew in a bag. Well, you probably know what I told Philip and Jeff. I said that they should check out the Warthog Electric Systems on HighGravityBrew.com. Whether you're going single vessel or two or three, I've had mine for several years now. If you go to High Gravity's YouTube channel, you can see Steve and me brewing on my system for the very first time when my hair was darker and there was more of it. The uh, Warthog Brew in a Bag system has been improved uh, even since then, so... Uh, there are there are some differences between the way the system was then and the way it is now. 
For example, the temperature sensor is now in the kettle and not the lid, so you can mash without using the pump if you like. But I And I still use mine on high gravity or higher volume batches to, to pump that to the wort through. Also, the EBC-130 controller is a big improvement over the original controller that came with my system. So that's proof that Dave is always looking at ways to improve. Whether it's a single vessel system like mine or a two or three vessel configuration, highgravitybrew.com has you covered. And if you use the code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks off your Warthog electric purchase. That's at family owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. That's highgravitybrew.com. I got an email from uh, Thomas, who writes in from Holden, Massachusetts, who says he, it would be interesting to me at least to listen to how you decide on hop pairings. To this point, I have borrowed, in parentheses, stolen, from recipes found online. Is there an actual process, a secret, that could be useful? I know that experimentation is one answer, but have you seen all the hops that are available, yikes! I don't have the, this. I don't have that much time left in this life. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so do you have any advice from Tom, or for Tom on hop pairings? How do you guys figure out what hops to put together? What are your resources besides your own palates? Sure. I. I mean, you can certainly. I think Scott has put. Uh, you know, back in the day, he and I both put together sort of. Um, analytic measures where, oh, if you want to mimic this hop, you can mix these two hops. I'm more and more in the belief that, um, you know, the ratios of those sort of like core, you know, myrosines and humulene and ferrocene and uh, is, isn't telling the whole story, um, that there really isn't, um, it's not really like a simple way to pick which hops are going to mesh together. Well, we, I, I mean, the the tried and true you know hey there are a lot of great beers out there with citra and galaxy that's a great combo there are a lot of great beers with mosaic and simcoe that's a great combo um that's certainly the easiest way again particularly when you're starting out um after that it can be things like mixing a couple of hot pellets of each variety together in your hands and rubbing them together and smelling them Mm. and and saying to yourself does this smell good um you know there's a lot to be said for trusting your own gut instinct on things like taste and smell that, um, you know, good or bad, you know, make, make, make a call. Don't think about it too much. Just really, um, you know, smell it and say, does this smell good? Um, you can certainly be more analytic about it. You can certainly take, um, we recently did a beer called new roommates. That was an IPA with a uh, hydro, which is a relatively new hop that's grown in Michigan. Um, that to me is um, all the good things I like about Galaxy. It, it, it almost smells like Bazooka Joe gum. Mm. It is um, fruity, almost in a sort of a comical, over-the-top sort of way. Um, and we paired it with uh, Strata, which is a, a Pacific Northwest hop that is a much more sort of dank, herbal, earthy, um, you know, uh, you got to legalize it, man, sort of way. <laughs> um, and when the beer was young, I, I thought it worked really well. Strata has, um, to me, it's almost like Citra on steroids. It has a intense fruitiness, but with some of that sort of mosaic dank thing. And for the first three or four weeks, I was, I was into it. I thought that the, you know, sort of cut the tropical thing, but the problem was as the beer aged that, um, the sort of citrusy thing died down and then it became the sort of weird bubble gum with, um, oregano kind of thing mm. where it was just like you you wouldn't put candy and herbs together in anything you know candy is a, a dessert flavor herbs are a, a savory kind of thing and so that's sort of to say that you know you can have the best intention of the world you can smell the hops before you dry hop and think it smells good but then um you know just over time no no matter what you do the beer will um, shift and evolve and the best thing you can do is to take notes and write yourself a little, hey, if I get my hands on some Hydra again, I'd lean into that fruity thing and do uh, Vic Secret and Galaxy. Or, hey, I want something that's citrusy, but that doesn't have that herbal thing behind it. Um, and sadly, so many of these things are, there. there isn't a simple answer to them. It really has to come down to 
figuring out what works for your palate. Um, you know, that not all hop varieties, you know, you can get Citra from, you know, three different farms or three different lots from the same farm and they're not all going to smell the same and being ready to um, call an audible. Mm. And more than once we have opened a bag that we're planning on dry hopping a beer with in five minutes and Scott will come over and say, give this a smell. I'll say, whoa, that's, that's got, you know, it smells like old, old bark. And he'll say, yep, that's, I thought old bark. <laughs> um, and then we'll say, okay, let's, let's see what we have in the walk-in that we can substitute. Hmm. And in many cases that if he hop makes a totally fine boil whirlpool edition, a lot of those weird flavors get, you know, volatized. Um, but so often uh, we'll say, I was joking about Galaxy earlier. Galaxy has, for us has been very unreliable. We um, sometimes we get really great Galaxy, and sometimes, more often than not, we get Galaxy that t- tastes like peanut shells. Ooh, um, and it's, I I don't know what what the reason is. If it's a a crop thing, if it's a processing a processing thing, what what's causing it? But uh, I've heard the same thing from a lot of the brewers. At a certain point, you just have to, you know, not think about galaxy as a, a single monolithic thing that could be um, put into a recipe. You really have to open your hops and smell them. And um, if they don't smell good, particularly for dry hopping, um, seal them back up, get get a food saver, and hopefully you've got a pack of something else in the freezer or a homebrew store that's close by that you can swap in. Um, because if a beer does, if a hop doesn't smell good out of the package odds are it's not going to make a great beer uh, for dry hopping in particular. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to stick in my, my plug for small batches. Uh, I think, you know, the hop sampler series that Steve and I, um, that Steve and I did with those one gallon batches, you know, inspired, that's a direct ripoff from your first appearance on the show. Uh, (laughs) But, you know, those um, small batches of beer, you know, it's low stakes, uh, and you can really taste the, you know, the difference in those single hop uh, beers, um, you know, and if you don't like it, you've, you've just got a six pack that you can pawn off on your brother-in-law that you don't like or something like that. But <laughs> well, and th- there's just, there's just so much beer to drink now. I mean, 20 years ago, you really could try all the local beers and have time to drink a whole batch of homebrew. And, and now you could go to five local breweries and get a, a new, you know, eight beer sampler once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, that if all you're looking for is variety, that's a lot easier. And, uh, you know, as a home brewer, it, it's a lot easier to, yeah, make one batch and split five ways with five different dry hops and really learn something about what, um, what hops you enjoy, or, or again, you know, really go, go to, go to brew pubs and try those beers and, and make notes about, you know, wow, I keep finding, I, I like the beer with Simcoe in it. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should make a Simcoe beer. Yeah. That's a good point. Now it, it, to, to add to the confusion, uh, in addition to all the hop varieties, there's it seems like new hop compounds coming out all the time. That we, <laughs> it's like an, a new subatomic particle or something. Uh, you know the the and I'm you know I'm con- I'm confused about them. Even though I've read Scott's book, uh, <laughs> I'm still confused. So how important is it that you know novice recipe designers? know about the humulones and the cohumulones and the, all the, you know, all those, uh, you know, the subatomic particles of, of hop compounds, you know, when they're, when they're designing their recipes. Um, I would, I would very much put that as an advanced brewing sort of thing to consider, you know, the interactions between a thiolized yeast from Omega that's going to free particular compounds from particular hops and the synergy it's going to have with these compounds from another variety. Um, even for us, even for me working with Scott every day, those things are very much still um, uh, crap shoots, probably not quite the right word. It, <laughs> we, we sometimes just have these wow beers where we used a, a, a omega thiolized strain with Pato hops, which are a new super high alpha variety. And it just, even before dry hopping, just tasted like straight grapefruit juice. And it was distinct and remarkable and whatever. And sometimes we'll end up with something that's more sulfury than we think it should be. Or we'll end up with something that just um, 
before dry hopping has an amazing white wine, passion fruit flavor, and then you dry hop and that seems to be completely gone. Um, that's very much still in the realm of um, scientific trials. And, and when we talk to these yeast labs, they're still tweaking these strains and adjusting what they're going for and, and things like that. And so um, I would very much just rely um, starting out on, you know, your palate, you know, smelling the hops, um, tasting the beer as it ferments, those sorts of things to figure out um, what's going to make a beer that's, that's suited to your palate. Um, and, you know, again, you know, ripping off somebody's recipe when somebody finds something that really works or when you taste something at a local brewery or a local homebrew club meeting that really um, piques your palate, um, you know, talk to the brewer, see if you can send an email to, to the brewmaster and say, hey, what, you know, I don't need the specifics on how, you know, what percentage Pilsner malt versus wheat malt versus oat malt. But hey, what 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 hops are in the whirlpool or which which ones did you dry hop with or um, that sort of thing can really um, be a, be enlightening. Ella from Tavor says there are some delicious selections available for you to pick up this month. Ella says they're getting beers from Bottle Logic Brewing in California. They're new to Tavor and they're sending two amazing barrel aged beers, a stout and a barley wine. New Grass Brewing in North Carolina is offering fruited sours. And you can find Scorpius Marcella and King Sue from Toppling Giant this month. Tavor is not a beer of the month club where somebody picks beers for you. You choose the beers that you want. You sign up by going to Tavor.com or by downloading the Tavor app. That's T-A-V as in Victor, O-U-R. And you'll see new beers every day. And when you see something you like, click on it to add it to your crate and your beers will ship in a few days to save shipping as your crate fills up. It doesn't cost anything to sign up, and there's no obligation to purchase anything. In fact, if I can ask you a favor, go to Tavor.com, that's T-A-V as in Victor, O-U-R.com, or download the app, and when you sign up, enter the promo code BASICBREWING, all one word, and you'll get $10 off your first shipment of $25 or more. Again, it's free to sign up. There's no obligation to purchase Sign up at Tavor.com or with the Tavor app and enter Basic Brewing as the promo code. In in these these days, of course, I'm I'm lazy, uh, so I I rarely dry hop. Um, what what am I missing? I mean, how what in your mind uh, in a in a really delicious you know sort of modern either a West Coast, you know, uh, IPA or a New England IPA, uh, how, what weight do you put in importance on, say, whirlpool hopping or late hopping uh, on the hot side as opposed to dry hopping? Yeah, I'd say that I mean, there, there are a decent number of compounds that are highly volatile. And and a lot of those, the, the myrosines of the world, and and honestly, Scott will argue that like a lot of these compounds are bad, that, you know, myrosine is this very green flavor that you, in a New England IPA, you don't want a, a beer that has a lot of green, vegetal, piney sort of flavors. Using older hops or using hops that, you know, are in the in the kettle is going to volatize a lot of those. Um, but but to me, there are certain sort of distinct compounds. Uh, when I do, when we do whirlpool hopping, we taste the beer before dry hopping. It often has, I would say, a generic hoppiness. It has a citrusy, um, a citrusy flavor, or it'll have a um, tropical flavor. But it's often um, doesn't sort of say something particularly. Versus after we dry hop with Simcoe, I'll say, "Wow, that's got this great mango flavor." Or after we dry hop with uh, galaxy that's got this great passion fruit flavor it it to me gives those sort of um probably low, lower threshold but also more volatile um compounds from the individual hop that really send it off in a varietal direction hmm. and that's something we've been sort of playing with in terms of like what temperature we dry hop at we've been dry hopping colder and colder rather than sort of the the mid fermentation thing or how we've been agitating the hops. We've been getting more and more aggressive with how we are, are blasting those hops back into suspension as 
as a home brewer, I miss the days where I could just shake the carboy or shake the, the brew bucket a little bit to get the hops resuspended when you're dealing with a 600 gallon tank, that's not an option. <laughs> um, and, and trying to get that, like, we're trying to push that varietal flavor from the hops so that we have a bunch of different IPAs and they taste different without going too far, at which point you just start getting the like harsh green grassy, um, you know, uh, hot burn or polyphenol sort of like, um, roughness. Mm. Um, and so we're trying to get that, like, I mean, it's, it's sort of what you do if you're making coffee or if you're making tea, you're trying to hit that right amount of time where you've pulled out the good stuff, but you haven't started pulling out the bad stuff. And that's sort of the, those are the kind of the trickier tricks that um, are, are difficult and, and vary so widely between um, different systems and different setups and, and probably different, you know, pelletizing processes and things like that. And that's where a lot of the art comes from, I'm assuming, because there isn't a book with, you know, a, a, a formula on how much to dry hop of a certain kind, you know, <laughs> a certain variety yeah. of hops. Uh, you've just got to figure that out yourself. And, and that's, I mean, I think the real, the real, and I would say only advantage commercial brewers have is that we do the same thing over and over and over and over again. That the fact that Scott and I every month are doing a pale ale an IPA and a double IPA and on the same equipment. And each time we're, you know, we're tasting it after each dry hop, each, each time we rouse the hops, we're dialing in for us what makes a really great IPA. And as a home brewer, or honestly, as us, where we sort of, we only do it once a month. There are breweries that are doing, you know, 10 IPAs a week. Um, and, and though, you know, the, the more you iterate something with intention, the more you do it and think about it each time and track it each time, the more uh, improvement you'll see. Mm-hmm. And, and that's sort of the same thing, you know, with, with, with specialization of any kind. And it's the same thing we hope to do with, you know, the sour beers and with the stouts and, and with everything, you know, you, you do things over and you make tweaks and changes and you evaluate and then you say, is it better or is it worse? And then you um, do it again, push a little more in that direction, put a little more in that direction and, and see what makes, um, you know, the, the best beer for you. And, and for us more and more, it's become, making sure not only do Scott and I like it, but does our bar manager Spencer like it? Does our brewer Ken like it? Do the people out at the bar like it is, you know, I don't put a huge amount of, of stock in untapped, but you know, there's something (laughs) to be said. If, if a bunch of people come in and say, this is a a delicious beer, um, even if they're not, not the most um, expert tasters in the world, if they, you know, if more people really enjoy it and drink more of it and rather than just getting a half pour, want to go home with a four pack, that says something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it takes, uh, it, it takes a different sort of gear as a brewer to say, you know, I think it's a little bit sweet, but that's the thing that more people enjoy. And so I'm going to make it a little bit more sweet than my taste would direct me to. And as a home brewer, you don't have to deal with that. You can just make a beer that you think is delicious. Right. Yeah, it comes it comes in another uh, common theme, brew a lot and take notes. <laughs> yeah. And 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 honestly, I, I didn't do a good enough job of that for about the first year. We were just so busy and we were doing all these things. That, and I just sort of felt like, oh, I'll, I'll remember what I liked about this or that. And then about a year in, I just went, I have no recollection of, of <laughs> half of these beers. And so now I... I, I make a point earlier today, I sat down with our new uh, IPA with Ruwaka and Citra, and I wrote up my notes on, yeah, we had findings, we had biofine this time, I thought it was a little bit smoother than usual at a weekend, um, the Ruwaka hops really popped, they had this great diesel dank thing, but the Citra really helped to, to mute that, I could see pushing that, you know, it, and even that just sort of like, what would I do next time, what is... What are my thoughts on it right now as I'm drinking it rather than trying to remember six months from now, you know, what I thought was a good idea? Well, I could I could talk to you for for hours on this topic and we would still be scratching the surface, I'm afraid. Um, it's it's always good to get together with you. And I told you before we started recording that there's a, there's a direct flight to Washington, D.C. from northwest Arkansas. So uh, 
who knows? We've, we, we've got a beautiful guest room here at my house. Uh, sadly, <laughs> the, the brewery just has a really uncomfortable couch that I think Scott may be the only one who spent a night on. <laughs> but we'd, we'd, we'd love to have you up. We'd love to, to brew something with you. I've been, I've been uh, talking to you for, you said 2006, 16 years now. Oh, we, uh, we should make some beer together. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and, and you know, the plane comes back this way, too. <laughs> but you're you're too busy <laughs> well i we, we've we've finally hired a second brewer so i i may actually have some time to uh get out of my uh my rut of the the, the pandemic slash uh, uh busy brewery and uh you know do some traveling and a little bit more writing i i haven't done a post on the blog in about a year and a half at this point so oh it's my. getting it's getting it's getting desperate wow shake the dust Shake the yeah. dust off that keyboard. Uh, well, you're using it to do spreadsheets. So, well, I, 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 I write. If anyone wants to hear my writing, it's uh, I, I do all the uh, email uh, updates for uh, Sapwood Sellers. Sign, sign up for our email list, and uh, you'll you'll get a bunch of stuff that most of the people on the email list don't care about. <laughs> well, you forget who you're talking to. This audience loves. Loves the details. That's, that, well, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. They're the ones who would be for the, the people who just want to know uh, what, what, what the food trucks for the week are may not be as uh, <laughs> interested. Well, Mike, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate your sticking with us for as long as you have. And, and uh, I, in, I will enjoy seeing uh, the next chapter as it unfolds. It's, it's always a pleasure, James. And, and again, we uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you up here and uh, have a, a, another in-person uh, recording. Well, thanks again to Mike. Always great to talk to him. You need to follow Sapwood Sellers on the socials. Mike and Scott are always posting pics of delicious beers. Makes me want to book a seat on that DC flight. One day, I promise. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions... Show suggestions or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Until next time, until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is brought by Kelly Dots. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.